we're talking about the secret to a happy marriage for the next four weeks. And I don't want you to miss it. I want you to make sure that you bring somebody. And this series is for married people, obviously, but it's also for those who aren't married, but maybe one day you want to be, or even for single people that say that I'm not ever going to um, get married, then you need to learn some of these principles about uh, getting along with others and so forth. So this series is going to be very helpful. And I hope that you will take the invite cards and invite somebody. In fact, invite somebody to come to church with you and say, you know what, I'll take you to lunch after church because they'll be more apt to come. And uh, invite people. We're going to do a wedding reception on the fourth week, which is February the 5th. And uh, we are going to have a, a vow renewal service. This is going to be so much fun. And so if you'd like to be romantic, guys, if you want to win some good brownie points, you be here that day and you renew your vows. We're gonna ha- it's going to be really nice. And uh, we're going to have a reception afterwards, cake and the whole nine yards. You need to invite people just like it was your wedding. Okay, and, and I'm telling you, the purpose of this series, of course, is uh, to help, number one, us focus our attention on God, uh, number, uh, number one, uh, to make sure that our relationship with God is right, but number two is to help us in our marriage and help us in our human relationships. At, but then I would say also that one of the purposes for this series is that we want to use it as an evangelistic tool to be able to have people come to church, hear about Jesus and a relationship with him and have their lives transformed, okay? And so that's kind of our goal in this series, our goals. And so I hope you'll uh, do your part and invite people. And it is going to be, I think, a lot of fun. Over the next four weeks, I'm gonna talk about communication next week. If you've ever had trouble communicating in marriage, Ladies, if you've ever been frustrated because your husband speaks in headlines and you speak in fine print, um, my wife is that way. She wants to know details that I didn't even think of to ask. And uh, if you want to learn how to communicate, then be here next week. And then we're going to talk about conflict resolution the week after that. And I know nobody here has ever had any conflict in marriage, so... You know, you don't even have to show up if you don't want to. So, uh, and then the, the last week, we're going to talk about connection for a lifetime. How to stay connected. What does it take? And we've got some wonderful examples of marriage, uh, of godly biblical marriage here in our church, of people that have been married for a long time. And uh, you would do well to get to know them. You would do well to learn from them. Um, I heard about one guy that uh, he said the secret to a happy marriage was that after they'd been married for a year, they figured out that for them to be successful, they needed to go out twice a week. He went out on Tuesday and she went out on Friday. So maybe that's what you need. I don't know. Well, I love marriage and I love being married and I love the institution of marriage. I love what it does for people and families and I love what it does for our culture. And the Bible is very clear that your marriage is to mirror the relationship between Christ and the church. All right, so get that. Your marriage is to mirror the relationship between Christ and the church. What is that relationship like? Well, the relationship between Christ and the church is uh, characterized by love. It's characterized by forgiveness self-sacrifice, putting the other person's needs ahead of your own, and undying commitment. So we're going to learn how that works over the next four weeks. Um, I, you know, in our culture, uh, they say that marriage is a place of self-fulfillment. If you can find your soulmate then uh, as long as you feel like soulmates, then you're destined to be together. And so all of our actions spring from our emotions, how we feel. But biblically, 
marriage is not a place of self-fulfillment, even though marriage is very self-fulfilling. But marriage is a place of self-sacrifice. That's what marriage is supposed to be. And when you do that, not only will you emulate the relationship between Christ and the church, you're going to have a more powerful emotional connection in your marriage. You're going to love each other more. You see, love sometimes has to go beyond the, motion, the emotions. I mean, do you remember what it was like when you first got together? Your heart pumped peanut butter every time you saw her, you know, if you had a pacemaker, uh, your, your pacemaker would open and close the garage doors every time she walked by. You were so excited. You were so emotional uh, about this. But then after a while, um, as I've said to my wife, you know, she said, you're not very emotional. I said, anger's an emotion. What do you mean I'm not very emotional? But after a while, if, if you just root it on emotion... Then you're going to throw in the towel. You're going to quit. You're going to say, well, it doesn't seem like this is worth it. But if you model a biblical marriage, it is a place of self-sacrifice. And the amazing thing about this is when you are living that way as a uh, self-sacrificing partner in that marriage, then your marriage will be happier, it'll be more fulfilled, and the emotions will be there. But you've got to learn that the Bible pattern is actions first, emotions second. Actions first, emotions second. Now, how we operate in our culture is emotions first, actions second. My emotions uh, are the foundation for my actions. But that's not true with Jesus. And so, um, so my goal in this series is basically to show you the heart of Jesus and so what we're going to do on this first message, which this message is called commitment. We talked about the other three messages that we're going to do. This message is called commitment. How do you make a commitment? There are three things you're going to make a commitment to, and I'm going to talk to them, talk to you about them uh, for just a few minutes. Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. That'll be our foundation for this message today. Going all the way back to the beginning. Here's what the Bible says. God had created the world. He had made man and woman. He had brought them together. And God's uh, speaking to Adam. And Adam is talking here. Uh, and then Moses uh, fills in after some of the things that, uh, that Adam had said. Here's what he says. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. I like the old King James. It says, you're to leave and to cleave. I like that word. You're cleaving together. There is a very intense commitment uh, in cleaving. And they shall become one flesh. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but if you take two pieces of paper and glue them together where they become one and you try to tear them apart, it always damages the paper when you try to tear them apart. And, and this is the principle. God wants you to become so connected, so one with one another, that you'll not come apart, that you will cleave together. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now I want to give you three thoughts today about commitment. The first is this. You've got to have a commitment of faith. In other words, you've got to have a commitment to God. You say, where do you get this from this passage? Well, uh, it's there. I want to show it to you of how uh, the foundation for Christian marriage must be a relationship with Jesus Christ. First and foremost, are Christians susceptible to divorce? Of course there are. There's many Christians that have been divorced. Um, the, the fact is, just because you're a Christian does not mean that you're not going to have marriage problems or that you're not going to face uh, difficulty. You are married to another fallible, sinful human being, okay? Of course you're going to have problems. Uh, so God never promised a fairy tale, but he did promise a blessed marriage if you'll follow him and do what he says. And the first part of that is you got to commit to God. 
The word one flesh in the Hebrew language is the same word used in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 4. That's called the great Shema. Um, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, and here's the word, one. One. God wants you uh, to have a, a faith foundation for your marriage, and He wants you to have a commitment to Him before you have a commitment to anything else. That's how it works. You see, some people think that um, two Christians or two, a man and a woman, that they're a half looking for their other half before they can become a whole. Well, that is not true. That's not biblical at all. In fact, the Bible says there are some that God has given the blessing of singleness, not that marriage isn't a blessing, but that in that, that he has called them to this and that they're able to focus more on serving God and other things in life. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about that. Um, and then uh, there are those that are single and want to be married, and you need to be following these principles beforehand, okay? Uh, but this idea of oneness or completeness comes from our relationship with God, and then when a husband and a wife commit to each other and become one flesh. Now, is that talking about a sexual relationship? Yes, part of it is, but it's far greater than a sexual relationship. It is a spiritual connection, a spiritual oneness, but it's also a physical and emotional oneness. That does not mean that you're not an individual when you are married. See, here's the biblical math. It's not one plus one equals one. I've heard a lot of people say that. Uh, they get that from Genesis. One plus one equals one. Man plus woman equals one. Well, that's not what that scripture says. That scripture says man plus woman plus God equals one. So it's not one plus one equals one. The biblical math here is one plus one plus one equals one. The Lord is one. He says we are to be one flesh. Well, uh, the Holy Spirit has the power to transform you just in the same way that he will save you when you come to him by faith and rest in his grace he can save your marriage as well. He can make your marriage stronger. He can make your marriage better. In Genesis 2:22, uh, right before the verses we read a moment ago, it when God created Eve, it says that he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. The word brought means to be brought in, to be brought into. It's like a oneness relationship. And it also means to be introduced. You introduced them. Uh, so I uh, get the picture. God had created the world, the animals, the universe, everything. Adam had named the animals. Adam sees that he doesn't have a, a helper that's, uh, you know, good for him. And uh, God causes him to sleep. He takes a rib and makes uh, the woman from man's side, which, by the way, that is another reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church. It was from the side of Jesus that he was stabbed with a spear on the cross. And from his heart, the church was born. And just as in the same way that the church is to be uh, there in that loving relationship with Jesus Christ and come from his side, Man and woman are to be beside each other in a loving relationship because the woman came from man's side. She didn't come from his foot. She didn't come from his hand. She didn't come from his head. She came from his side, indicating that partnership, that loving relationship, that oneness. Um, and Adam got very excited. When he saw her, he said, at last. That's the English translation. It's a very strong exclamation in the Hebrew language. He said, at last. I, I get the idea that he was like, you know, uh, camel, no. Um, elephant, no. Um, sheep, no, that would be bad. Um, you know. <laughs> and finally, he sees a woman, and she's naked. And he goes, yes! 
finally at last. And God brought him together. He said, uh, at last, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. The first poem or song that was ever written or composed was Adam in a romantic and declarative relationship between him and God and him and her. He was declaring his love for her. Um, So we're to be one in Jesus. And I love this because even though uh, we have uh, distinct properties, and I do realize that in our culture today, there's a lot of nonsense talking about, you know, gender and there not being differences and blah, blah, blah. A third grader can tell that there are differences, okay? And, you know, now we are one in God. We are both human But if you think that a man and a woman are exactly alike, you slept through just about everything, all right? Not just science class. Um, And and put all that aside. Put culture aside. Put uh, even science aside. What does the Bible actually say? Here's what God said. He created them male and female. That's what God said. And he did this. In fact, he even used different words in the creation of man and woman. In Genesis 2, 7, when God created man, that word, you know what it means? It means to squeeze out. There you go. Man came from dirt. Woman came from man. The word that is used to uh, create the woman, it is a completely different word. It means to build skillfully and carefully and to fashion so the next time you go shopping you tell your husband that's the way God fashioned me I love fashion all right so um, but here's the point that God made us differently but he made us to become one now you know I could talk all day about the differences between men and and women I, I, I love the fact that we're different i got to be honest, if we were the same, if we were exactly the same, I would not be married, all right, because I was attracted to my wife because she was different than I was, than I am, and I'm still attracted to her because of that, and so uh, that's a part of that loving relationship. Your oneness and your completeness are founded on your relationship with God. So number one, you got to have a commitment to God. Here's the second commitment. You need a commitment to your spouse. Now, I do realize that in our culture, it is much easier to get a divorce than I would like for it to be. I do realize that there are reasons for divorce. The Bible makes exceptions for that. There are reasons for divorce. And if you've been divorced, understand this. You're not second class in the eyes of God. Um, Everything in your past, if it's put under the blood of Jesus Christ, so is that, okay? So it doesn't matter if you've been married before and remarried or whatever. The point is this, what God has for you right now, uh, the marriage that you're in now, this is what you should commit to. This is what you should stay in. This is what you should do to make a very strong commitment to each other. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Um, You see, in the previous verses, we need to understand, it says, therefore. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. There are some things that will define the the purpose for marriage for us. Um, We are to worship God as creator. So what did God do in that? Uh, in that creation, he created worshipers. That's what he did. So we're to worship God together. Uh, he uh, is our provider, our sustainer, our savior, and we are to exist for his purpose and pleasure. And so God is, is showing us that as a married couple, we are to have that relationship with God and that commitment to each other and it is for the purpose of serving God together. He said to the, uh, to the man and the woman that they're to have dominion, they're to rule over the earth and the creation, uh, that, they are, that there was a kingship 
and an ownership, if you will, that was declared before they ever sinned. And so what God wants us to do is to have this commitment to one another. Now, how can you do that? Well, once again, just coming to church doesn't mean your marriage is perfect, okay? But I do know this, you got a lot better chance of keeping that marriage strong when you do come to church regularly. You know why? Because you're being encouraged. You're uh, having the Word of God taught. You're in corporate worship. Uh, You're able to serve. It's making you stronger, okay? It's very, very important. Now, when he said that we're to uh, commit to each other, he was not suggesting when he said leave father and mother that you should have nothing to do with your parents or your family. But what he was saying was now there is a higher priority that's established. And that is with you and your spouse. Uh, it doesn't mean you abandon your family. Uh, the concept there, and I love this in the Hebrew language, that idea means to move toward each other. That's the concept. Now let me ask you a question. If as a husband and wife, you are moving toward each other, do you think you got a better chance of being happy? You think you got a better chance of being committed? Do you think you got a better chance of having the same goals and uh, serving God together? Of course you do. Do you think you got a better chance of understanding each other? Yes. This is incredibly important. This idea of moving toward each other is a commitment that is for the rest of your life. Um, And in that concept, we find if you're moving toward your spouse, you know what you're doing? You're working to understand them. You're working to support them, to show them love. And I realize I could make a thousand marriage jokes, and they're funny, okay? But here's the point. Marriage is no joke. Now, if you can't laugh about some things, then you're not going to last very long. I'm going to say that. But I do know this, that when you move toward each other, you're learning, you're, uh, you're adjusting. You know, there are a lot of things I had to adjust in my life when I got married. And I, I can say, after 36 years of marriage, that I love Kim more than I ever have. And I'm more committed to her And I see the good in her more than I ever have, okay? Now, don't think that that came just by magical fairy dust, okay? You know how that came? It came through a commitment to God and to Him and to serving my wife. You know what I did? I began to move toward her. You know what she did? She began to move toward me. And even after 36 years, we're still moving toward each other. I had to learn to adjust some things. I didn't know that I'd brushed my teeth wrong for my entire life until I got married and she told me that I was doing it wrong. Um, I had no issue with toilet seats until I got married. Um, One night in the middle of the night, I heard a scream. Kim had gone to the bathroom and I guess I'd left the toilet seat up and she fell in. I like to never live that one down, but I tell you what I do now, I put the dang toilet seat down. I can tell you that. You know what that means? That you're moving toward each other, you're adjusting, and you're adjusting uh, with Jesus. Uh, So uh, that is a commitment to oneness. They shall become indicates an action that's already completed by God. Now, I realize that's kind of technical, And some of you are like, yeah, yeah, that's boring sounding. Go tell some seminary kid that. Uh, But the idea there is in this commitment to oneness that God is the one that's going to complete it for you. And I love this because it leads into our next point. You've got to have a commitment to rest in God's grace. You've got to commit to God, to faith, to a relationship with him. You got to commit to your spouse a strong commitment. Then you got to commit to rest in God's grace. If you're going to move toward each other, if you're going to shall become uh, allowing that relationship with God to be what completes it, resting in Him doesn't mean you don't work, doesn't mean you don't ever apologize, it doesn't mean you don't ever try to be romantic, doesn't mean that you don't ever communicate. 
uh, it doesn't mean you're never going to make a mistake. But this idea is that I'm resting in the grace of God to do something that was miraculous to begin with. And it needs God involved with it for it to survive. I don't know if you realize how miraculous and amazing the relationship between a man and a woman really is. I'm, I, yeah, I get it propagates the human race. I get that. And it's a foundation for society and, and rule and order and law and family. And, and I get that, okay? But it is absolutely amazing. In fact, King Solomon, who the Bible says was the wisest man that ever lived, I, I always believe the Bible. That may be the one that I have a problem with because he had 700 wives. And I'm not sure how wise he was, to be honest with you. He had 300 concubines. Now, a concubine was a wife that their kids could not inherit or be a part of the heritage. And I heard about a little boy that went to the church, and he came home. His mom asked him, what did you learn about in church today? He said, I learned about Solomon. She said, what did you learn about Solomon? He had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. So (laughs) my point is this. He said, and he was a wise man. He said that there are seven things that just are amazing. And one of the things he said was the way of a man with a woman. I want you to think about it. The beauty of it, the nature of it, it is incredible. It is incredible. And it was by God. It is to God. It is for God. Notice those commitments. God did it. I'm commit to him. I'm to commit for him. I'm serving others. I'm doing his will, his work. And when that happens, I rest in him and he completes that shall become one. Isn't that amazing? So the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. The concept of being naked and not ashamed is underpinned by their trust in God. Uh, it showed that they were able to be vulnerable and open and have confidence and trust. Next week, I'm going to mention some things that are basic emotional needs for men and women. And you need to understand that God is the one that created that, and he gave us the pattern to fulfill every one of those needs. And one of the most important things is that resting in his grace Trusting in him to complete it. Um, They enjoyed life and they enjoyed each other. There is nothing wrong in a Christian marriage with enjoying life. In fact, I believe you should enjoy life. And if you're constantly miserable, I'm not sure that it's because you married the wrong person. A lot of people say, well, I married the wrong person. I don't know about that. I know that maybe you're following the wrong principles when it comes to meeting that other person's need. I get that, okay, because we can be very selfish as human beings. But in them, when they were naked and not ashamed, there was no shame. There was no covering up. They didn't have to hide. Can you imagine how blissful that kind of relationship would be? Now, I want you to understand as I wrap this up. Don't think that God has a perfect choice for you that he created, and that's the only person in the world that's for you. I don't think that exists. You know why I don't think that exists? Because if one person got it wrong, then everybody would get it wrong. You you see what I'm saying? I mean, uh, all it takes is one or two to screw up the whole thing, and then everybody's married to the wrong one, and nobody gets to be with the right one. There is a concept of a soulmate in the Bible, but it's not between husband and wife. It's between David, who became king, the one that killed the Goliath, Uh, the giant Goliath, and King Saul's son, Jonathan, they were soulmates. They were bound together. That was their friendships. And that that was was not a romantic or sexual thing, but that was a powerful friendship. So there's that concept. But this idea in our modern culture of that you've got to have your soulmate or else you're going to miss out or else Uh, You can't stay in that marriage because they're no longer your soulmate. Well, that is not scriptural. Um, Because you have to learn that there is no perfect choice 
but only a choice that is being perfected. Okay, let me say that again. There is no perfect choice, but a choice that is being perfected. And if you rest in the grace of God, you'll be able to live that way. And you'll be able to rest, and God will complete it. And yes, you'll have to work at it, and yes, there will be tough times, and yes, you'll get aggravated. Of course, you're going to get aggravated. That doesn't mean you don't love each other. I think that often we worry and stress about our marriage when we should be resting in the grace of God for Him to complete it. I found that women worry about their future until they marry, and a man never worries about his future until he marries. Uh, And then it kind of reverses, right? Um, But we've got to rest in Jesus Christ. Now, when we keep Jesus at the center of our marriage and trust in God's grace, we fulfill God's purpose in marriage. And anything that is not used for its purpose gets abused. Let me repeat that. Anything that does not get used for its purpose gets abused. God created you for a purpose. Your marriage is for the purpose of being to him and for him and resting in him. And if it's not doing that, It's open to abuse. Now, what kind of abuse can there be in marriage? Well, sometimes it's physical because it becomes violent and angry. Sometimes it's verbal because everybody's mad at each other. Um, Or they just like to cut each other down uh, because they're good at it. Um, Or sometimes it's neglect. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it simply doesn't reach its potential. Do you know that a marriage that does not rest in Jesus Christ. Talking about a Christian marriage. That's really an abusive marriage because you're abusing what God created you for. And we all know this. Anything, anything, any tool that is not used for its purpose will get scarred. Um, I used to have this rubber mallet, rubber hammer. You've seen those. And they're not meant to nail nails. They're meant to, you know, do things without breaking them. And when our son, he's grown now, but when he was a little boy, he loved to hammer things. He loved to hammer nails. I went in the garage or wherever he was one day, and he had a bunch of nails, and he was hammering them with that rubber mallet. Now, I kept that rubber mallet as a reminder of living for God's purpose because that rubber mallet was completely scarred and abused. But I want you to know that the good news is this. I was able to repurpose that rubber mallet. Can you imagine that if a life that Jesus Christ died for, maybe it's been abused. Maybe it hasn't reached its potential. Maybe it has not fulfilled its purpose yet. But when it, And maybe it's scarred Maybe there are deep, deep scars on you. But when you give it to God, when you give your life to God, he'll repurpose you. He will use you for his glory no matter what the past, no matter what the scarring is. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless marriages at this church. Not just our church, but all churches, Christian marriages. God, I pray that you'd just help us today to follow you with all of our heart, to make a total commitment to you, a total commitment to each other, and a total commitment to grace. And I thank you for everyone that is able to hear this message today, that you would use these words from the Word of God to be a blessing and a challenge to them. Now, before I finish my prayer, online and in the room, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Savior, making that commitment to God, that's the first step. I want to encourage you to do that today. Say something like this to God, a simple prayer. God, please save me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross and rose from the grave. I believe he'll forgive me of my sins. And I'm asking you to forgive me and to change me and to use me. If you'll pray that prayer, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Online, click the button at the bottom that you pray to receive Christ. In the room, fill out the next step card and let us know that you pray to receive Christ. 
But the second part of my prayer is this. How many would say, Pastor, God's word spoke to me about something in my life. Maybe it's about your marriage. Maybe it's not even related to marriage. Maybe it's something that God spoke to you about in the way you talk or committing to resting in him or, or whatever. But you'd say, Pastor, God spoke to me about something today. And I want you to pray that I would be able to make that commitment to God. Would you raise your hand? Hands all across the room. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just uh, bless those that reach out to you for salvation today. Bless every marriage in the room today uh, for those that you've spoken to today. And God, we want you to know that we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.